We're now recording. Hello, everybody, and welcome on behalf of the Center for Crisis Studies and Mitigation at the University of Manchester. My name is David Schultz. I'm professor of synoptic meteorology and PI of the center. The purpose of our center is to develop a wide network to bring together different researchers across the university and the world working on natural hazards and their impacts on society. Anyone can join and stay informed of our activities, so please get in touch if you want to be a member and sign up for the newsletter. Um, you can do that on our webpage um, on the University of Manchester website. To stay informed of our activities, you can also follow us on Twitter at UM Crisis Studies. This is another one of our continuing webinars in our series that now has been going on for exactly 12 months. So happy anniversary to us. <laughs> Many of them are recorded and available online at our YouTube channel. Our next seminar will be Zoe Hampstead from the University of Buffalo. She'll be speaking at 4 p.m. on 15 June, and she'll be talking about extreme uh, weather, heat, and cities. The format of today's talk will be as follows. During the seminar, you can enter questions in the chat box or save them up. We'll do our best to get to them all during the question and answer session at the end. For now, let me introduce our speaker, Dr. Chika Watanabe, is Senior Lecturer in Social Anthropology at the University of Manchester. She is the author of Becoming One, Religion, Development, and Environmentalism, <clears throat> in a Japanese NGO in Myanmar. Uh, this is published by the University of Hawaii Press. And she's also written other works on development, religion, secular, religion and secularism, and disaster preparedness. So let me hand it over to her. The title of her talk is Playing Through the Apocalypse, Preparing Children for Mass Disasters in Japan and Chile. Dr. Watanabe, thank you. Hey. Thank you so much um, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, so this is uh, based on an article that's actually about to come out, um, but it's still work in progress. So I'd welcome, yeah, um, I'd be happy to hear your thoughts, feedback um, on, yeah, anything that I'm talking about. Um, so it's based on the research I've been doing on uh, international cooperation around disaster preparedness between Japan and Chile. And I've been doing this with a disaster studies scholar, Dr. Jenny Moreno um, at the University of Concepcion in Chile and Dr. Shuhei Kimura in, at the University of Tsukuba. Um, and, you know, sort of the big questions that I'm interested in is basically, you know, what is preparedness or in Japanese, bosai? Uh, what form of being in the world is that? How do you teach that? I'm interested in questions of pedagogy. How do you teach people to be prepared for basically unpredicted mass disasters? Um, and how does the notion of preparedness organize society in particular ways? Uh, and I'm also interested on the other side, in the other side of, um, of the project, which is about international cooperation and how does the translation of knowledge um, happen in these international cooperation programs? Um, you know, a lot of I think there's still room for some ethnographic exploration um, around that. So let me share my screen. I have slides and I also, there will be a video as well. So let me share my slides. Great. All right. So yeah, so the title is Playing Through the Apocalypse. I'm just, great. So on a sweltering August day in 2019, almost 400 people attended a neighborhood event on disaster preparedness for children in Kobe, Japan. Two girls and one boy, each about nine years old, stood in front of a long rectangular table staring at 12 photographs, images of a two liter water bottle, emergency food, duct tape, plastic shopping bags, a raincoat, and other everyday items that one would need in an evacuation kit. 
The large laminate, laminated printouts were secured onto a black cloth hanging from the front edge of the table, as you can see in the picture. You have 30 seconds left, shouted a smiling middle-aged man in a bright orange t-shirt, standing with a stopwatch in one hand. The children continued to look intently at the photographs, one of them with fists clenched. Five, four, three, two, one, time is up. A woman with short gray hair, also with an orange t-shirt, pulled another black piece of cloth over the images and taped the edges. The photographs were now hidden under the cover. Now, said the man in an excited voice, let's see how many you can remember and we'll go in order. He pointed to the boy furthest from him. Water, the boy shouted. Yes, said the man. Another man sitting at the table wrote something on his clipboard. The first man then gestured to the girl in the middle. Raincoat, she got it right. The third girl also remembered correctly. Flashlight, they quickly took turns giving answers until they couldn't anymore. The man with the stopwatch winked at the children and pointed to the edge of the black cloth attached to the table. To the table. T he began to say, tape, one of the girls excla exclaimed. Oops. That's right, the man clapped. Do you know why the duct tape is important in an emergency kit? He asked the children. One of the girls pointed to the duct tape on his chest where he had written his name uh, with a thick black marker. Yes, of course you can tape things with the tape, but you can also write where you are going to be if you have to evacuate from your house and tape it on the front door so your family knows where to find you. Tape won't fall off or fly away, he explained. These children had remembered nine out of the 12 items correctly, and the adults praised them for having done well. The children took out their event flyers and got one stamp each for the activity. So this memory game was part of an event called Iza Kairu Caravan, which literally means in a pinch frog caravan, and I'll just mention it as caravan in this paper. Um, and it was an event that a neighborhood association had organized in conjunction with a summer festival in that community. The caravan is the signature activity of a Japanese nonprofit organization, Plus Arts, and it's now being implemented by different organizations across Japan. So I'm gonna show you just two minutes of this promotional video about Izakairo Caravan, just so you get a sense um, of what it looks like and um, the, the history behind it. Kairu Caravan refers to five heroes in frog costumes who fight against evil. <laughs> Sorry, just kidding. Kairu Caravan is an emergency drill event that you can enjoy with your family and friends. First of all, let's look at the history of Iza Kairu Caravan. In 2000, Hiroshi Fuji, an artist, created a toy exchange event called Kaiko Bazaar. Participants exchanged toys for points, and then exchanged the points for other toys. This event quickly grew in popularity, and many children participate every time it is held. Most emergency drills don't have high participation rates because they're a bit too difficult or uninteresting for most people. This event combined an emergency drill and a toy exchange to attract many people, making it a successful emergency drill event where lots of children and their families got together. This is how Iza Kaidu Caravan started. Kaidu Caravan uses goods and tools which have the motif of frogs in the emergency drill conducted at the event. In this way, the emergency drill was transformed into an event that children can enjoy. Yay! Emergency Drill Program There are many programs, so not all of them can be introduced here but you will see some of them. In the target game using a water extinguisher, participants learn how to use an extinguisher 
by discharging water at frog-shaped targets. In the time trial with a blanket stretcher, participants learn how to make a stretcher using familiar and accessible goods, as well as how to carry a person using a human-sized frog figure. The Bucket Brigade competition provides an opportunity to learn about forming a quick bucket brigade. Participants are divided into two teams and have a bucket brigade competition. In the Jack Up game, participants learn how to rescue a person using a jack by rescuing a human-sized frog figure trapped under a heavy catfish figure. There are various other programs that will be useful in an emergency. We'll just stop it there. Um... But you get a sense of uh, what the games are like. They also have board games and card games, which I'll mention later on. Um, so in this paper, I described this phenomenon of the caravan to shed light on how people in Japan and in other countries are using playful methods to prepare children for future disasters. The form of preparedness um, through play orients children and by proxy their families to accept a catastrophic, a catastrophic future and learn survival skills. The assumption among both state and non-state disaster preparedness advocates is that we live in a time of apocalyptic certainty. So the state and its emergency services like police, firefighters, ambulances, and so on will not be available in a major disaster. Um, they will be victims themselves. So meanwhile, infrastructure such as roads will have collapsed. So in this apocalyptic landscape, children and those immediately around them will need to figure out how to survive on their own. Echoing government advice, Nagata-san, who is the founder of Izakairo Caravan, often tells community groups that citizens need to be prepared to survive the first seven days of a disaster without outside help especially in the context of two major disasters anticipated for Japan, the country, the Nankai Trough Megathrust Earthquake and the Tokyo Inland Earthquake. So the aim of preparedness through playful means is not better management by the authority, but the ability of citizens and especially children to survive within a limited time frame. So ultimately, I argue that these playful methods help the state buy time. Under the combination of natural disasters and neoliberalization, disaster preparedness actors agree that professional state-backed helpers will not be able to come immediately to the rescue. The disaster education of citizens becomes important in this context because they are asked to assume the liability of the risk that disaster poses. So in the face of a future apocalypse, the neoliberal state depends on what I call stalling effects that help defer its promise to come to citizens' assistance. The use of playful methods of disaster preparedness with children contributes to these effects by persuading citizens to first accept this apocalyptic future and second, engage in preparations for survival in heteronormative family units while they wait for state help. So then what are the mechanisms of playful engagement that entice children and their families to contribute to these stalling effects. So the focus on children is key here. The notion of the child as future, common in many societies, is um, it's easy to see in the caravan as parents and event organizers invest in children as saviors in a disaster. The child symbolizes a potential way out of a foreclosed future. But a more important discourse is present in the caravan children as influential intergenerational nodes of kinship and community relations. So Plus Art staff members, as well as other people that I call disaster advocates, so people like disaster scientists, state officials uh, working on disaster preparedness, nonprofit organizations like Plus Arts that are promoting community-based preparedness efforts, and individual citizens invested in preparedness. So I'm just calling them disaster advocates. Um, so these people argue that targeting disaster education at children is more effective than targeting it at adults because family members will listen to their children while they might ignore advice from experts and state officials. So playful methods in the caravan might not amount to fully persuasive games, as Ian Bogost argued, 
um, that convince people to start preparing for a disaster right away or, or transform existing systems. Um, but, they, but I argue that they do command attention. An important mechanism of playful engagement that emerges from the ethnography is what I describe as attentive play. So the creation of an as if world that grabs the attention of children as well as adults by always raising the question of, is this play? So Gregory Bateson, watching animals in a zoo, famously explained that play unfolds only as if the activity were real. A nip may be a playful nip, but it could be actually a real bite indicating aggression. So playful action is defined by, by this as ifness, a condition of, dif of holding different realities as possibilities. As Bateson explained, there is always something more than meets the eye in playful methods, beckoning people to look twice. So the ambiguity or double take in the playful methods of the caravan are particularly effective in calling for intergenerational attention. For the sake of space in this paper, I focus on only one form of double take. That is, it's not always clear to participating children and adults if the games are just for fun or educational. Um, and other double takes might be between fiction and the terrifying reality of disasters. Uh, so according to the caravan organizers, they need to be both, right? Both fun and educational. Because if the event was just fun, you know, amid other available forms of entertainment, parents and, and schools might not bring their children. On the other hand, if the event was just educational, children might resist engaging with it. So this double take of fun and education is essential in attracting both children and adults to these activities. So as states around the world continue to retreat from providing services and ensuring welfare, or are too weak to withstand major disasters, state actors will increasingly need ways to buy time because as much as the state is retreating, it's unlikely to completely disappear. So I show in this paper that engaging children is emerging as an ideal way for the state to play for time. But as the ethnographic descriptions in this paper show, the as if quality of playfulness is also what makes play exceed its ideological effects. So over the past 15 years, Plus Arts Caravan has become extremely popular in Japan and other countries. So in my project, I study the caravan in two places, in Japan and in Chile. In Japan, the caravan is well established and various groups commonly co contact Plus Arts with the wish to create their own event. In that case, one or two Plus Arts staff members will visit the interested group to carry it out a one day or two day training. After that, the group and its community members plan the games and event themselves. And Nakata-san always encouraged groups to redesign the games as they see fit to suit the context and concerns of the local area. The members of the neighborhood association described above, for example, had done the caravan for five years, and over time they had created their own games. And Nagata-san, you know, and Plus Arts are very open about, you know, you can use our designs and toys and all of that, you know, for free. Uh, well, not the toys, sorry, the designs. In addition, Nagata-san shares his know-how with disaster experts and government officials from different countries through the Japan International Cooperation Agency, or JICA, training center in Kobe. So JICA is one of uh, the Japanese government international aid agencies, and it offers training courses on various topics, including disaster risk reduction, DRR, or BOSAI in Japanese. Nagata-san is regularly invited as a guest lecturer to introduce the caravan to training participants from around the world. And this session often ends up being the participants' favorite lesson, and many of them have gone on to replicate the caravan in their own countries. And one of these countries is Chile. Um, and it's a country where, you know, among many disasters, in 2010, it was devastated uh, uh, by a magnitude at 0.8 earthquake and tsunami. And one of the cities that was impacted by this disaster was the south central coastal town of Talcahuano. The town has the country's first municipal level DRR department, the Department of Disaster Risk Management, um, or Departamento de Gestión Integral de Riesgo de Desastres, or DGIRD, which was established in 2011 with the help of the United Nations Development Program and the European Union. Um, all DGIRD staff members have trained in Japan, 
And many other disaster as advocates in the region actually also have gone through JICA training courses. The director of the DGIRD, Boris, has participated in four JICA training courses since 2012 and organized uh, several caravans. It seems that a model of a disaster preparedness regime centered on playful methods that engage children is spreading from Japan to other parts of the world. Uh, despite scholarly analysis, the hail and era of preparedness, you know, disaster advocates often told me that ordinary citizens are not really engaged enough with preparedness efforts. So Japan is a place where disaster preparedness is prominent in public discourses, especially in relation to earthquakes, but also floods you know, and other kinds of disasters. Uh, disaster preparedness measures are legislated from the national to the municipal level, and they're integrated into school curriculum. Chile is also a country that experiences many earthquakes and tsunamis, and has a national agency committed to disaster preparedness um, and other forms of emergency, the Oficina Nacional de Emergencia del Ministerio del Interior y Seguridad Pública, or ONEMI. And yet, despite the relentless uh, disasters that destroy large parts of both countries, as well as frequent official messaging about how to respond, disaster advocates tell me that people are not interested in engaging with the issue. Um, and this is not really unique to Japan or Chile or to current times. Um, during the Cold War, although the United States government invested great energy in convincing children, uh, citizens to build shelters and prepare for nuclear disaster, few of them did this. You know, they were more concerned with immediate issues such as, quote, race relations, taxes, and education, as Tracy Davis has shown. In the current neoliberal world, citizen non-engagement is an acute problem for the state. Naomi Klein's concept of disaster capitalism has shed light on the predatory outcomes of a retreating state in post-disaster situations. The shrunken state is also evident in DRR as international organizations, local government bodies, NGOs, and private corporations take on much of the preparedness efforts around the world. The concept of resilience has been fundamental to the neoliberalization of DRR, as according to Jonathan Joseph, the state steps back and encourages, quote, the idea of active citizenship, whereby people, rather than relying on the state, take responsibility for their own social and economic well-being. So the empowerment of individual citizens to become resilient in the face of disasters is central to the neoliberal state's preparedness strategies. But the state is not completely excused. Right? Citizens are expected to survive the first few days or weeks of a disaster, but only in anticipation that the state will eventually come to the rescue. Before the state rescue materializes, citizen engagement with preparedness is critical for national preparedness. Anthropologist Ryan Sayre argued that disaster advocates in Japan have created approaches of, quote, preparedness that is not called itself, bosai to iwanai bosai, in an attempt to address this disinterest without fighting it head on. So although the city of Kobe was destroyed by the magnitude 6.9 Hanshin allergy earthquake in 1995, many disaster advocates lament that people are beginning to forget or have already forgotten the disaster and its lessons. And it was this concern that led Kobe city officials to ask Nagata-san to design a way for people to proactively engage with disaster preparedness efforts. And so what he came up with mobilizes children as purveyors of preparedness. This targeting of children um, and through them their families is also evident in Chile's approaches to disaster preparedness. A core initiative of ONEMI is Familia Preparada or Prepared Family which seeks to promote, quote, self-help and a culture of prevention in Chilean families. It, it forms part of a wider set, set of policies advancing autocuidado, or self-help, and community-based preparedness efforts. The Familia Preparada Handbook recommends that families first constitute themselves as Comité de Seguridad Familiar, or Committees of Family Security, in which each member should assume responsibilities tackling various risks commensurate with their age and personal strengths. Using cute illustrations, the document proceeds to take readers, so the children and their families, 
so various interactive exercises from listing family members and their medical conditions to a checklist for an emergency backpack. The assumption is that local Onemi branches and other disaster advocates at the municipal level will distribute the handbook to each family in the area. So this focus on children and families in Chile needs to be understood in the context of a highly neoliberal state. As it's well known, Chile became the experimental grounds for the US neoliberal economists called the Chicago Boys, who advised Augusto Pinochet's military regime in the 1970s. And since then, Chile has become a model of free market neoliberal reforms married with authoritarianism. Accordingly, state structures are not only driven by the free market, but also decentralized while still maintaining a highly centralized control of power. And this is reflected in ONEMI. Although it's decentralized in its network of regional offices, in the event of a disaster, the ONEMI headquarters in the capital of Santiago has the authority to marshal firefighters, the armed forces, and civil actors from the municipal level up in accordance with the central government's orders. There's also now an even stronger neoliberal hold on the state as the right-wing billionaire president, Sebastián Piñera, took office immediately after the 2010 Chile earthquake. So the recent histories of neoliberalization and disaster preparedness unite Japan and Chile, but there's also a broader commonality in their attention to children as vehicles of a prepared nation state. As in other regimes of government, children in Japan and Chile have served as vectors of societal change and organization. So in both countries, the child has particularly indexed a better national future amid a general anxiety about the country's need to develop. In late 19th century Japan, as foreign powers encroached on its borders, politicians and intellectuals realized that the development of human resources, particularly through children in schools, was key to Western conceptions of modernity and Japan's survival on the international stage. Since then, the education of children has played a crucial role in Japanese efforts to construct a modern middle class and simultaneously individual and socially integrated child citizen, as some people in the audience have researched. Um, so children have played a similarly central role in the making of modern Chile. Historian Nara Milanić illustrated how social and legal conceptions of the child and family in 19th and 20th century Chile were fundamental in shaping post-colonial national aspirations as well as entrenching class inequalities. The state, she writes, quote, employed kinship as a central category of legibility and legal personhood, helping create an underclass of individuals who were bereft of the entitlements of family. So these individuals uh, were often poor mothers and children who without proper kinship did not have access to the legal, political and economic benefits of the patriarchal family. Children who were abandoned or, quote, unmourned from natal kinship, specifically patriarchal kinship, became known as uachos. And this figure of the uacho is significant in Chilean national narratives. The anthropologist Sonia, Sonia Montesino analyzed its analogy as the indigenous woman abandoned by the colonial man, leaving behind a male son who depends on and sanctifies the woman mother. And this imagination of the Uwacho child as illegitimate and exterior to acceptable sociality and yet integral to national identity has shaped various social and political projects of reform, resistance, and conservatism in Chile. And so invoking the child to organize and reorient society is a long established phenomenon in Japan, Chile, and elsewhere. And this is similarly visible in the proliferation of child center approaches in global preparedness efforts. As various scholars have argued, children become ideal vehicles for post-disaster neoliberal governance, contributors to proactive preventive approaches to disasters, and effective resources for communicating disaster risk to family and community members. So in the caravan, children are efficacious in signaling to adults a possible way to survive the future collapse of society. Again, it's important to remember that the state is not entirely absent, but simply deferred. Children then signal a limited temporary form of survival. 
Echoing other disaster advocates, uh, DGIRD Director Bodies often said that children were important intermediaries for adults' involvement in preparedness efforts. He told co-organizers of the caravan that, quote, adults need to participate in the activities, not just stand back while children play the games. The target of playful methods was primarily children, but not limited to them. This involves intergenerational engagement between children and adults. But you know, what makes such engagements possible? Um, as I mentioned, you know, it's this as if quality of playfulness that facilitates this intergenerationality. I find it useful here to think of play as an adverb, as Max Watson proposed, quote, in the sense of how one does a game, one might play a game playfully or angrily or reluctantly, just as one might drive a car playfully or angrily or reluctantly. So I argue that to play a game playfully means keeping two possible worlds in view. What I call attentive play is a method of commanding attention that foregrounds the as if quality of play, keeping in view the uncertainty of whether this is just for fun or educational. And it's this duality that keeps the attention of both children and adults in the caravan. Richard Schechner explained that, quote, play is in the subjunctive mood, the what if or as if, the provisional, the open, the anti-structural. So the as if character of play is maintained by, quote, some degree of metacommunication, that is of exchanging signals which would carry the message, this is play. So as Gregory Bateson illustrated, a playful nip denotes a bite, but it's not a bite. And it's only play to the extent that all actors involved understand that, right? Once the meta communication changes, so the message of this is play turns into this is anger, the understanding of the bite changes. And Irving Goffman drawing on Bateson, you know, famously proposed the concept of framing to explain how people make sense of a specific social situation to the continuous production of context. Frames are multi-layered in what Goffman called keying as, quote, the set of conventions by which a given activity is transformed into something patterned on this activity, but seen by the participants to be quite something else. So this resonates with Bateson's bite, the same activity seen differently depending on the context or the meta communication. Holding these different keyings in view is what I would call playfulness. But what distinguishes keying and play is that the latter always involves an element of fun. And although some people have called playful activities with an educational purpose, serious play or serious games, others have argued that the phrase is a tautology because play is always already um, serious. As Petra Kalshoven has argued, something is at stake for the players and there are rules that need to be followed seriously in any playful activity. So counterintuitively, this seriousness is what constitutes fun. Ian Bogost argued that play is a serious matter because it's about taking the world as it is and doing something different with it. Seeing his young daughter make a game out of rushing through a shopping mall, stepping over the grout lines on the floor tiling as he, her for as he pulled her forward, he realized that play is never about free play in the sense of having no limits. Play is about, quote, determining what is possible to do given the meager resources provided. So the playing within this limitation he proposed is what makes something fun. Attentive play can involve different forms of the as if. So here, as I mentioned, I focus on one, the ambiguity between fun and education. My argument that this double take is what attracts children and adults respectively relies on the context in Japan and Chile, where it's assumed that children are primarily interested in fun and adults in education. And you know, in reality, this dichotomy is flawed because children can also yearn for education and adults for fun. But nevertheless, it's the frame for a child and adult in Goffman's sense here. Um, and it's the coexistence of fun and education in the caravan that commands attention piquing the curiosity of both children and adults. So as Boris explained to co-organizers of the caravans, you know, it's play, but not disorder. Es juego, pero no desorden. This duality of entertainment and education and conceptualizations of play for children is also not new. 
Meredith Back has recently traced the Euro-American history of optical toys, which were both enjoyable and educational, nurturing children's, quote, ability to interpret, analyze, and scrutinize visual material. This market of toys reflected the 19th century concern with using leisure time productively, especially for the rising middle classes. Similarly, the history of middle-class childhood and play in Japan includes the coexisting ideologies of children as the hardworking superior student, Yutose, who's immersed in schooling, and the childlike child, Kodomorashi Kodomo, who's engrossed in seemingly chaotic fun activity. So this marriage of fun and learning is ubiquitous today and reflects the widespread middle-class values of both socialization and autonomous creativity for a proper childhood. The caravan captures this duality of play by constantly raising the question, is this play? And this became visible in the DGIRD's biggest caravan to date, which took place in Talcahuano in May 2018. Over 500 students between the ages of 9 and 11 came to the event hall from different schools. There were 20 booths at the event, staffed by adults from organizations such as the Chilean Red Cross, with some activities led by primary school students who had participated in past caravans. One of the most popular booths was the bucket relay, designated as Trabajo en Equipo, teamwork. Students formed two teams, standing in rows, and they raced to pass along a bucket of water from one end to the other. This was a technique that could be used in putting out fires. The children were visibly excited, shouting to their teammates even before their turn started. One of the adults overseeing the activity, a municipal staff member, raised her voice to tell them that this was not a competition. Apparently, one student in an earlier group had run with the bucket full of water from one end to the other without passing it to anyone else, which was ingenious, but completely missing the collaborative point of the activity. So she explained to the students that the objective was to do the process correctly and together, not to win the race. The children nodded, and as soon as the adults gave the go sign, they began to fiercely pass the bucket from one person to another, spilling water all over the ground. So an activity that can excite young people to this degree is a dream come true for disaster advocates. However, as adults knew, the caravan's games must also educate. Children need to learn the process of passing a bucket of water effectively so that they can survive a fire, a disaster that threatens Talcahuano residents every winter. So to what extent is this play? Uh, Steven Nagmanovich stated that, quote, students of childhood play are looking for an educational payoff, but when we deliberately cultivate that payoff, we're no longer playing. So similarly, people who organize the caravan face the challenge of balancing an educational outcome with the funness of play. As difficult as this task is, the dual possibilities of the playful methods are what attract both children and adults. Boris and the other disaster advocates in Talcahuana continue to organize the caravan every year, constantly redesigning the games to achieve the fine balance between fun and education. Children engage in these activities with a sense of learning, achievement of skill, and fun. And asking both children and adults to navigate the ambiguous framing of the games, you know, is this play, helps hold their attention. The attentive play of the caravan presents a new way for people to engage with the future, accepting the apocalypse to come and learning how to survive. This survival skill will theoretically buy the shrunken state some time. Nevertheless, the stalling effect of playful methods is not guaranteed. As the bucket relay showed, children will often run amok, ignoring the educational purpose. In a fire, they might remember the buckets, but forget how they pass them down the line. If, as a consequence, they die, most likely these children will not be blamed for their own deaths. The absence of the firefighters will be scrutinized. Citizens will eventually demand the state to take up responsibility. After the Kobe earthquake of 1995, while survivors helped one another and themselves, some also formed an association to hold the state accountable. So if the preparedness efforts of the caravan are successful, children will incentivize adults around them to help others survive as well. And this solidarity could lead to collective demands on the state. So the double take of playfulness indicates an ambiguity 
which means that play can also exceed the ideological effects I've described here. To investigate this possibility, it would be fruitful to understand better the children's own phenomenological worlds in and beyond the caravan. So an ethnographic exploration of these children's worlds could reveal a possible way that the child as futurity from the child's perspective might not be as determined as the story of the state stalling effect suggests. Uh, and this would be a topic for future ethnographic research. The use of play in disaster preparedness is popular and there have been over you know, 150 caravans across Japan since 2005 and dozens more in 11 other countries. Nagata-san told me that when they first started the caravans, many media outlets and policymakers criticized them for trivializing disasters. And despite this initial public resistance, plus arts has succeeded in making their playful methods popular in Japan and elsewhere. So play has different effects in different, in different spaces. In disaster preparedness, I've argued that what I call attentive play mobilizes children and by proxy their families to take care of their own survival, contributing to the neoliberal shifting of responsibility away from the state, even if temporarily. This buying of time is disturbing. The state, after all, still needs to fulfill its duties of care toward its citizens. The failure to do so is increasingly excused in the face of emergency situations and austerity measures. As I wrote the first draft of this paper in Kobe in August 2019, several typhoons had just crossed over Japan, which triggered a number of alerts. During one of these events, I saw on television repeated announcements for households in a particular town to evacuate, designating, designating the alert level as level three, in which the elderly and those who require more time should start to ev evacuate or a level four when everyone must evacuate. But what does it mean to evacuate when a typhoon is coming? How do people know for sure if they're the types of people who need to evacuate at level three? How should everyone evacuate? What should they bring with them and for how many days? Right, so these are questions the citizens should know how to answer so that they can survive while they wait for outside help. And this is what disaster advocates are working toward equipping individual citizens with the knowledge and skills to come out of a disaster alive. In this scenario, the state's absence is absolved because of the overwhelming sense of crisis. The logic is that in the face of an all-consuming disaster, we cannot reasonably expect the state to help. Self-reliance becomes a citizen's civic duty. I should note the public officials I met at the municipal levels in Japan and Chile were devising ways to assist their constituents. But this unloading of responsibility to underfunded local government is part of the state's stalling strategies today. The calculus of buying time leaves people in a lottery of survival. One's chances of making it through the apocalypse alive depends on whether or not one has reliable family nearby, helpful neighbors, a well-resourced municipal government, a healthy body, and as this case has shown, whether or not one has children. The uneven distribution of these resources is not random, and yet individual citizens are expected to be responsible for assembling them. If they lack any of them, it becomes their fault. The long-standing use of naturalized ideologies of kinship and childhood to advance the aspirations of the nation state help in this misrecognition of the duty of care. Following this logic to this conclusion then, when the state finally arrives, it will be people with children and heteronormative and middle-class families who have survived. So ultimately, the neoliberal resilience expected of each of us seems to be not so much individualized as heteronormativized. So thank you. Yeah, the article will come out um, in public culture um, sometime soon. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. <clears throat> it's interesting to note early in, in your talk, you mentioned um, about about how children were, were knowledgeable and and because um, we noticed something very similar um, before I, I came to Europe, I lived in Oklahoma and there was and, and the children in, in Oklahoma public schools get trained on tornado um you know protecting themselves and their families against tornadoes where the safe places are 
you know, climb into the bathtub, pull a mattress over you, that, that kind of stuff. And, um, then two year, three years after I got there, there was a major tornado outbreak. At that time, it was the most expensive tornado outbreak and mm -hmm. no one in Oklahoma died. Um, that was in the parent, um, you know, the age range that, that, that parents would, would mm. be their children. And, and as you probably know, you know, that that's a very different um, histogram than is, is common in, in many natural disasters. And, and it's yeah. believed because the tornado outbreak happened right around dinner time and uh, shortly thereafter, uh, families were all home. You know they're eating dinner um you know the children knew what to do because they were told in schools and and um you know helped protect help protect their parents wow that's great i mean you know it's very rare to be able to test if chil the preparing of children works um so that's really interesting um yeah and i'm not sure the the direct linkage but um, you know, I mean, there were order 50 some people that, that died in that outbreak. And as I said, I'll, I'll send you the, the paper if I can. Yeah. I oh, that would be great. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah, Petra, you have a question. Yes, thank you so much, Chica. That was really, really great. Really interesting to to hear how you engaged with with play, and um, I, I really liked your idea of attentive play and using a playful as, as an adjective to to denote uh, certain situations. Um, I, I was just wondering because in, in my own work, I, I've been influenced quite a bit by uh, the Dutch cultural historian Johan Huizinga, who, um, who who talks about um, play and, and sees it as something that is very free flowing and not bound by rules. Mm. And one thing I wanted to ask you about is um, that in, in his writings, and apparently he wrote first in German and then later in Dutch, the word for play to play and games is the, the same. It's, um, you know, in German, spielen, spiel. But in English, you get this difference uh, between play and games. And I was wondering um, in what, what, what you're engaging with, whether play becomes something different because you're mostly talking about games, games. which tend mm. to be rule bound. And, and I was really, uh, really interested in, in the end when you mentioned the, um, the task with the, uh, with the buckets, which the organizers want to run like a game perhaps, which, which, which has clear rules, whilst the children are in their own phenomenological place and I, I thought that was an interesting one too because in your use of as if you mm -hmm. seem to approach it from the outside an outsider is looking at something and analyzing where the as if lies while yeah. when someone is engaged and immersed in play um the as if is the made up world really and and one one is completely inside of that world during play. So, so I was just wondering whether you could react to those two, uh, two remarks, but I'm really, really fascinated by uh, how you engage with, with play. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, you're clearly the expert on play here. <laughs> um, there's a lot, yeah. Um, yeah, this difference between play and games is something that I'm you know, trying to work out. Uh, I, you're right, it's not free flowing play, you know, in plus arts in the games, I mean the games, you know, the activity because these are designed by adults, or even if it's with children, it's, you know, designed to be a game so there are rules. Um, but the reason why I've been trying to use play is because, um, because, I mean, the theorizing around the word play is more <laughs> interesting than, you know, the serious games stuff. Um, and I was taken with, you know, Ian Bogost idea of thinking of play as always already having rules um, in order for it to be fun, you have to have rules, even if, you know, they are changing, even if the children are making up those rules themselves, that there is always some kind of rule there. 
um, but it allows us, you know, this idea of, yeah, I mean, the theorizing around the as if. Um, but you're right. I think, again, I think, you know, this is something that I need to do when I build on this project is understanding more from the perspective of the children what playing means for them, um, which, you know, is a challenge. And I can't go right now to field work, but, you know, that's something that I really need to understand, um, understand better. Um, but at the same time, you know, one of the as if things that I wanted to look at, um, I'm actually more interested in the as if quality between um, the fact that it's play and the fact that it's about a terrifying disaster. So, you know, even if it's the children's own, you know, own worldview, surely they're not actually thinking that they're in a mass disaster when they're engaged in this game. So they are, you know, playing with these games in the as if. You know, it's a game about disasters, but we're not actually in, you know, we're not terrified. Um, and Nagata-san makes this very clear. These games can't frighten the children, you know, at the same time explaining what could happen during a disaster. Um, so I think the ASIF could probably still work from an insider's perspective, but yeah, that's something I need to, yeah, I need to look yeah. into more. Yeah, because it's so interesting too that play can transform and be generative of something else. So in that sense, it might kind of go against the uh, the ideas of, of the people who organize the playful activities. Mm. But sorry, Tika, I have to run yes. because my inv invitee just arrived. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, Thanks no, no so problem. Much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Um, Aya, did you get your question answered? Um, uh, no, uh, so Chika, thank you for uh, for your fascinating talk, as as always. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think Chika has actually, uh, you know, kind of, you know, as I was writing, I, she started to touch on this issue of neoliberal and the state, and um, but I think I I, I suppose my um, then kind of um, tangential kind of kind of question that comes out of that is you know I was wondering you know if you talk to like central government officials you know they wouldn't agree with you right they would say well you know we've got this both I you know this kind of preparedness um you know as a main policy uh, which the cabinet office deals with and you know etc and, and so of course you know you're looking at the the, the the state and when you say the state you're looking at the a kind of local level um right i mean it's, so so I, what i'm what i'm saying is like there are different layers within the state of course organization so i'm just um mm. you know just want you to kind of think about you know i was thinking you know if from from the point of like central government they would say yes we are actually doing this um you know full swing uh, we're not stalling it so i, I i'm just wondering mm. how you would you know is that an issue you know are you kind of fo focusing on the resource issues what what are, or, or you know or kind of rhetoric mm. you know what 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 do you mean um mm. by that when the state is you know um a buying time. Mm. That's actually a really good point because I could have probably made the argument that the local government, the municipal you know, offices that are running these activities, maybe even plus arts are an extension of the state. So they are present by proxy through these entities. I can definitely see that um, argument, but I guess, I guess because and I'm saying that because, you know, the national policy in Japan is, you know, having these three pillars of disaster preparedness. It's public aid, you know, um, kojo by the national government, and then kyojo, like, you know, mutual aid among neighbor, neighbors, and then jijo, self-reliance within the family, but also the child. So if I thought of it that way, actually, children, you know, and families preparing each other and themselves could be thought of as part of the national, that's the way that the state is present in people's everyday lives. Um, I can totally see <laughs> that. Um, but I guess I was thinking of the state as being more tightly um, identified with, you know, professional um, helpers, that's not the right word, but you know, like the um, police or firefighters, you know, that kind of thing, the professional brigades, you know, the national defense force or something, um, the, the professional actors that would come during a disaster. 
um, and they know already that they're not going to these people backed by the national government won't be able to come right away. Um, and so they're trying to say, you know, we won't be there right away, but therefore, you know, you need to, that they're, you know, they're make, they're preparing people to be ready for the fact that they won't be there. Um, so I guess that's what I meant by the stalling effect. Um, but you're right, I think I'm gonna have to think about that a little bit more where, what I mean by the state. Um, yeah, so thank you. <laughs> I got a, a question from Basak. Did, did, did you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Thank you very much for the fascinating talk, Chika. And so I wonder if the notion of normalization could be used here. As you show, caravan mediates two things. First, the disasters are normalized in that they are inevitable and cannot be prevented, for instance, by building more resistance buildings. Second, states deficient to respond is normalized. Building mm. on that, I wondered to what extent response of civilization of citizens are normalized by the translation of caravan-like practices into legal and political norms in the organization of states' disaster response? Mm. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I guess, I guess because in the Japanese side, you know, there is this policy of community-based preparedness is one of the pillars of how people need to be prepared. Um, you know, what I talked about, this mutual help. Um, I guess in that sense, the caravan is incorporated as an example of that legal framework of Kyojo and Jijo, the self-help um, and mutual help. Um, and in the Chilean side, uh, you know, I guess because of this familia preparada, the Onemi policy around, you know, preparing families, um, you know, that is part of the national I guess, political approach to preparedness. But I like the idea of using, yeah, normalization, um, yeah, as a concept. Is that something that like nuclear or disaster people or scholars yeah. use? Yeah, so uh, yeah, for nuclear uh, Fukushima, we use the, use the notion a lot of normalization of, uh, uh, right. well, yeah, normalization of uh, nuclear disasters because it became acceptable. So th they are no more seeking to prevent nuclear disasters, but they are ex uh, accepting and creating initiatives to respond. So just like caravan. Mm. So yeah, so there's a shift there, which is, yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, thank you. I'm gonna have to look into that. Okay, thank you, Erica. Unmute myself. Hi, Chika. Thank you very much. It's, it's really nice seeing how this project is developing. And I, I think my question is related to what Petra was saying about how children perceive play, but also how they perceive time. So I was really fascinated about the temporalities um, discourse in your talk. And when you mentioned at the beginning this idea that they want the children to be able to survive for seven days uh, before the state, the state intervene or there are help. But seven days for a child is really diff different from seven days for an, ad an adult. Um, so I was wondering if, if you are thinking of exploring this aspect of temporality as well, when you will be able to uh, resume mm -hmm. your field work or developing that. Because I, I, I think there is a lot in, in, in here about you know this idea of, of inevitable crisis and, and apocalypse and, and um, this kind of future that are coming and they're really negative, but how children perceive passing of time mm. or relate to time uh, emotionally is, is might be different. So mm. I was wondering um, if you are thinking of, of developing that aspect as well. That's a great question. I had not thought of that, but that is an, a great thing that I should probably look into because you're right, yeah, for a child, you know, this, the time frame will mean different things. And the children are not being told you need to survive for seven days. It's just that the design of the games in the caravan is that. Um, so if it's, so for example, there was a game um, and this wasn't by Plus Arts. I think it might have been the neighborhood association that created their own game, but they had pictures of different foods and the children had to put in order which foods they need to eat first be, you know, because you're, you have no electricity, so your refrigerator has broken. And so the children had to figure out, you know, which foods to eat first in the order that they would go bad or something. Um, but, you know, it would be interesting to then figure out, you know, what kind of idea of temporality are they working with when they're doing that kind of game? 
Um, yeah, so thank you. I hadn't really, really thought of that, but um, yeah, I should, I should, yeah, I should ask. I mean, at the same time, I think it's not, I mean, I talk about, you know, people are preparing to survive these disasters on their own, but I don't think they, you know, the children or the family stop to think, oh my God, this is a picture of my child carrying an injured person, you know, and we're going to have to do this for seven days. Like it's not, I think it's, um, it's like the assumed scenario across the event, but it's not necessarily something that people are, you know, consciously talking about um, what happens on the eighth day or, you know, that people are not consciously discussing it. But um, I think it would be interesting to actually try to bring that out a little bit more with interviews and, you know, actually interacting with children from their perspective. But yeah, thank you. Great. And last question goes to Peter. Um, oh, well, I, I have two, actually, if that's all right. Um, so um, thank you very much for your paper, uh, Chika. Um, so the neoliberal state is a concept that is doing an awful lot of work in this paper. Um, and But it seems to me that it's really being presented, at least in this paper, in a very monolithic way. You keep talking about the neoliberal state this, the neoliberal state that, as if they're all the same. Mm. But I'm wondering, is that really the most useful way to, to do the analysis? You know, what about variation? Um, and how, do the, uh, how does variation between states affect, you know, whether, they're, whether we label them neoliberal or not? Um, depend, how does that affect how all these issues are tackled? I mean, and I, I mean, I think, for example, of the current situation with the pandemic, right? I mean, you know, we, we actually have a, a real situation at the moment affecting the entire world, um, which is a sort of disaster, and states which could probably be described in some sense as neoliberal are actually, have actually responded in many, many different ways and have had many, many different outcomes. You know, you think about Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, the PRC, blah, 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 you know? So that's, that's not really a, a question, I suppose. It's a comment for you to react to. And then the second one might be more of a question. At the, right at the end, you said, um, I don't exactly remember that, exactly what you said, but um, if something, 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 then, it will be salvation by heteronormativity or something like that. Um, you know, some people will be saved or will be rescued because they happen to be in the right kind of family or something. I'm just wondering, is there actually any evidence uh, from past disasters in Japan or elsewhere that people have been rescued or not rescued um, because of that? Uh, 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 or, or is there any evidence about what, what, what in that, in, what in this state that we, uh, of, of Japan, uh, that may or may not be neoliberal, um, it, it enables people to be rescued in those disasters? Mm -hmm. No, those are great comments and questions. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so the first, the first point about the neoliberal state. Uh, I think you're spot on. I think you caught me in sh using a shortcut, um, which I probably shouldn't have. Um, so I think one of the ways that maybe I could think about this differently is, um, you know, related to Aya's question of maybe thinking of how state-like or you know state effects are being enacted through these different entities, like the local government, uh, neighborhood associations, even families, and so to yeah, I guess diffuse, you know, think of the diffuse use effects of the state in that way might be one way to think about it. Um, the, other, the other thing that I've been trying, that I've been thinking about but haven't really developed is that with Kimura-san, who's the disaster, the anthropologist in Japan, we've been trying, you know, we've been discussing that for the book that we co-author, we need to think about how to think about community-based or family-based preparedness without calling it all neoliberal because in Japan, there's a long history of households preparing for fires, for you know, bombings during the Second World War that you know, are families preparing or households or neighborhoods preparing, but not really in the, you know, in the lineage of neoliberalization. 
Um, so we need to do some historical archival work and, you know, he's going to have to do a lot of the heavy lifting in that sense. But, you know, we're trying to sort of, yeah, think about it differently. Um, I'm going to write a paper in, you know, for a talk I'm giving in June to think more about the place of the household um, in preparing for disasters. Again, thinking historically as well. The role of the housewife is also really interesting to me in households for preparedness. And all of that, I think, you know, should be, could be analyzed without resorting to this shorthand of neoliberalism. So yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Um, and yeah, in terms of the heteronormative family, yeah, I don't, I mean, that, that was just me following my train of logic. If this is what was going to happen, what is, I mean, basically because the peer reviewers and editors of the journal said, so what, like, so what happens after that? So then I, you know, hy hypothetically, if this were to happen, then we could assume that maybe it's people with children who will be able to survive here. Um, but, you know, we know from like Tohoku, like the, you know, Kamaishi miracle and stuff that the children, if they're in the school, then they end up saving the whole school, not necessarily the families, right? Um, so there are different ways. Um, so yeah, there is no evidence, you know, it's just me trying to um, pursue the, the logic to the end. But maybe as, you know, David said, Maybe there is there is some evidence, maybe not called evidence, but around the world um, that I could be looking at. Great, thank you. And uh, thanks again for everyone coming. A reminder, our next seminar will be on June 15th at 4 p.m. with Zoe Hampstead of the University of Buffalo on cities and um, heat stress and, and, uh, and that interaction. So thank you again, everybody, and have a good day. Great. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.